Good afternoon and uh, a very warm welcome to our retail market update this afternoon. And it's great to have you all joining us. Um, I'm Graham Bradshaw and I'm a partner on the commercial real estate team and the retail team here at Burness Paul. Um, I'm going to be chairing the session today. Uh, I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar alongside Scottish Retail Consortium and to be joined today by Kyle Monk, Director of Insight with the British Retail Consortium. Now, before we start, I have to do the usual housekeeping stuff, but I think we're all pretty familiar with the uh, please keep on mute kind of requests. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you have questions, then please do add them to the, the text function in the chat. And what we'll do is we'll try and pick up as many questions at the end of the session as we can. So the plan today is that um, we'll speak for about um, 30 minutes and then we'll hopefully have 15 minutes towards the end just to answer questions that have come in. So um, we've done a few of these sessions. Um, I've, I've spoken with Kyle a number of times over the last sort of couple of years and I always try and start these sessions by talking about uh, why it is an interesting time for retail. Uh, and frankly, retail has never let me down yet. Um, and right now feels like yet another sort of pivotal moment for retail, um, with both the UK and the Scottish governments recently announcing proposals that will see COVID restrictions and regulations removed entirely, a day that we thought maybe we would never see. But with that in, in hand, you know, the weeks and the months ahead will be the first time in two years that the sector has been able to operate without the spectre of COVID hanging over it. So I suppose you could say that the future of retail trading pretty much starts now, which means it's a great time for, for Kyle to be um, presenting to us today. But while Brexit is kind of almost forgotten uh, and we're now living with COVID, we're hardly free from problems and uh, issues in the market more generally. and. Um, of course, when we think about that, there's not uh, very far that we have to go. You know, the, the future of retail starting at a time when the cost of living crisis is, is really just beginning. Inflation rates are riding high, petrol prices are soaring, and the impacts of that are seen at our four courts and on the supply chain. Electricity and gas bills are about to increase quite rapidly, uh, and that's going to be one of the most prominent things to hit consumer pockets. And of course, we're now at a stage where um, you know, the, the, the markets are in turmoil today and in recent days because Russia is flexing its muscles across the Ukraine. So uh, if that's not enough to sort of put you off your step, you just um, wouldn't want to be relying on the British weather to cheer you up either. So it, it's, it's quite a, a kind of complex jigsaw of pieces that are set out before us as, as, as retail sort of turns a corner. And I guess it's... Uh, 21st century is perhaps a story about not just living with COVID, but learning to live with constant crisis. So uh, what we do know is that retail has perhaps been changed forever by the pandemic. Much talked about shift to online shopping. There's a debate over what physical stores are actually for now and what their role might be in the, in the future. And there's also a variety of other things in the horizon about ESG and other uh, factors that are now coming to prominence. So what we'd like to do is kind of throw all those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle at, at Kyle and uh, see if he can help us to try and uh, make some sense of, of all of that. Um, and, and so we're, we're delighted to have Kyle with us this afternoon. As I say, Kyle is the Director of Insight at British Retail Consortium. And in his time at BRC, he has he's become one of the kind of go-to expert analysts um, for uh, retail. In the recent times, he's been named one of retail's top 100 influencers alongside the BRC's chief executive, Helen Dickinson. And uh, he's also been called upon innumerable times, as I'm sure you would expect over the last 24 months to illuminate us uh, on the ups and downs of retail, whether that's in the media or in presentations, much like today's gathering. And so I would like to hand over to Kyle. I'll remind you, put questions in the chat if you can. And, and otherwise, yeah, Kyle, we all look forward to, to hearing what you've got to say, thanks. Thank you very much, Graham, uh, and thank you to Bernard Paul for having me today, and indeed all of you for uh, for tuning in. Uh, as Graham said, I'm the director of Insight, the British Retail Consortium. We represent uh, the significant majority of, of both UK uh, and Scotland retail on a variety of issues, both policy uh, and and uh, and larger change programs such as sustainability, um, 
data protection, uh, etc. So today I've, I've prepared a few slides uh, to essentially walk you through some of what we're seeing uh, as the trade body for retail. Uh, I'll talk you through some of the global global challenges that are affecting the, the sector, uh, how the UK economy is adapting, and then some of the retail performance measures that we capture uh, as a trade body. So to kick us off, I thought it'd be useful to talk a bit about the global picture. So you know, the global economy continued to recover towards the end of 2021, as we can see in the chart on this slide. So continued progress on vaccination programs globally in most advanced, advanced economies enabled a return to pre-pandemic levels of mobility and activity. Vaccination rates in emerging markets remain significantly below advanced economies, however, um, but bank, the bank, bank of England estimate uh, for UK weighted world GDP rose by nearly 1% in 2021 Q4, uh, and this is in line with forecasts, which is above, about 2% above the same level in 20, 2019. So over the whole of 2021, uh, annual average global growth was 5.2% uh, after a 4.3% contraction in 2020. So in a fairly rosier place than perhaps many expected uh, at this point in time. It's expected that global growth will slow somewhat in Q4 as, as, COVID, as COVID cases rose sharply in advanced economies uh, and global supply chains were disrupted as a result. Outbreaks of the Delta and Omicron variants met COVID cases increased across the Euro area, resulting in more voluntary social distancing by consumers and more mandated restrictions. Uh, local outbreaks also continue to weigh on consumer demand in China and affected supply chains as ports were shut down at various points uh, in the last half of the year. Elsewhere in Asia, generally, activity looks to have recovered uh, as the easing of the Delta variant uh, allowed a loosening of restrictions. Global supply chains continue to struggle to meet elevated global uh, goods demand, unfortunately. So one of the, the largest headwinds that we've got sort of in the pipeline for this year is, is inflation. So CPI inflation was 5.4% was in December and 5.5% in January. Uh, and this is a 2.5% percentage point rise since September. Uh, that's almost one percentage point higher than was expected uh, during the November analyst forecast. Core inflation, which strips out energy and other more volatile items, also picked up to 4.2% in December, which is a one and a quarter percentage point rise since September. Energy prices, which we can see in the right hand chart, rose uh, markedly in 2021 and explain and contributed to a one percentage point rise in inflation since September. Household utilities and fuel prices were both pulling down on inflation at the start of the year. Uh, but since then, gas prices in particular have risen sharply in October, uh, particularly in October. Uh, the retail energy price cap set by Ofgem increased by 17% for gas and 9% for electricity, reflecting future uh, higher future prices. They're expected to decline over the long, the longer term uh, forecast to 2025. Uh, however, obviously, uh, it shows how quickly things change. Literally, just today, uh, you know, since. Um, uh, the, the, the unfortunate invasion of Ukraine by Russia. We've seen energy prices, spot energy prices rise by 10% since Germany um, announced their, their uh, cancellation for plans for their, their Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from Russia to, to Germany. Uh, continued geopolitical friction has the potential risk of increasing uh, these shocks, although it's not in Russia's interest, nor indeed uh, Europe's to, to have a full... Um, to have future sanctions on, on gas gas supply. So how that evolves will still remains to be seen and analysts are divided on the, on the issue. So employment, another sort of benchmark of, of economic health, um, you know, employment continued to rise over the last quarter, redundancies remain subdued. So despite the end of the furlough scheme in September, uh, where many were sort of waiting to see what the, what the impact would be post the furlough scheme ending, uh, unemployment continues to decline. So, the labor force survey in the left hand chart uh, in the blue line shows the unemployment rate continued to decline um, and it fell to 4.1 percent in the three months of november which is lower than the five four point five percent expected uh, in most november forecasts employments continue to increase according to uh, the labor force survey there were nearly 120,000 more employees in the three months of november compared to the three months in august to august uh, hmrc data which is the, the paye data in, in the red line, which is higher frequency and, and probably a, a better indicator of true employment levels, uh, pointed to a further rise in the number of employees in December. Um, although these data are prone to revision, uh, even if they are potentially more accurate. Uh, while the number of employees is estimated to be above the 2019 Q4 level, so we're actually above 2019 employment levels, um, 
uh, the total employment level is still around uh, half a million lower. And this is owing to a decline in self-employment rather than um, PAYE, public, um, private sector employment. Uh, there are over 500,000 more people inactive in the labor market. So those without a job and who are not actively seeking one compared to before the pandemic. And the majority of this increase uh, reflects people leaving the labor force due to sickness study or other reasons that can be accounted for uh, easily. Some of these people may return over time, but most analysts estimate that around a third of the rise is related to the aging of the UK population. And this was definitely some, some of the challenges we saw within um, transport freight logistics. So a large contributing factor to the decline in uh, HGV drivers during the shortages uh, in the latter half of 2021 was put down to lots of people aging out or retiring early from that particular profession. Uh, the participation rate of those aged 65 or over is around 10% compared to just under 80% for those aged 16 to 64. Um, we've also seen that the labour market's tightened sharply. So the labour market is tight and has tightened further. Job vacancies hit a record high, which we can see in the right-hand chart in Q4, and the unemployment rate lows, uh, rose, sorry, fell close to pre-pandemic levels. This meant that the ratio, uh, so an indicator of labour market tightness, has also risen to a series high. Uh, survey indicators point to increasing recruitment difficulties in labour um, and general labour shortages across the economy. This high number of vacancies could also indicate a mismatch, so people are coming, coming into the labour market but not being able to match the jobs required, um, although some of these effects have abated since, um, since the pandemic began. What, what the, real, the real issue is um, the fact that this tightness in the labour market is putting upward pressure on wages. So consistent with a tight and tightening labour market, firms have had to offer higher levels of pay. Um, you know, the, this inflation uh, or, or cost of living crisis, as, as it's been branded, uh, is, is within the public's attention. And uh, as a result, lots of, lots of staff are being reported in surveys uh, as asking for, for higher pay. So the KPMG uh, REC uh, UK report on jobs was near record high record highs for much of the second half of 2021 already without the increasing pressures we've seen in recent months and rises to um, rises to energy prices. Annual growth in, in private sector regular earnings was around 4% in the three months of December, um, while most analyst estimates that uh, estimate that underlying pay growth has been around 4 to 4.5% in recent months <clears throat> to February. Uh, the outlook for wage growth and the implications for inflation uh, are, are a much bigger topic, so I won't go into too much detail now, but if you do have any questions, do feel free to get in touch with myself or, uh, or David for further info. So in summary, <clears throat> we've seen that UK GDP recovered to re around pre-pandemic levels. Um, we've seen that supply constraints have weighed on activities, so supply chains, material, component shortages are all limiting production. This is, however, a global issue, not one limited to the UK. Uh, labour shortages are weighing on activity as well, uh, with the most acute effects being felt in accommodation, food, health, construction, manufacturing. However, retail has also seen uh, disruption, particularly in um, <clears throat> at, at sort of a, a store level and in, in distribution. There's been a, real, a sharp slowdown in real income growth driven by, by um, inflation and, and uh, wage, wage income growth not, not matching uh, inflation. Uh, and this is driven largely by, by the energy price rises and, and increase in tradable goods prices that I mentioned previously. Housing demand remains robust. Despite all this, there's a, there's a large amount of accumulated savings within the economy. So nearly 200 billion uh, has been saved over the last 18 months, uh, although that's predominantly in the, in the higher income brackets. So the, the first and second income uh, quintiles have seen the largest rises, whereas the lower income quintiles have actually seen a decline in savings, but some of this is believed to be driving housing demand. Unemployment continues to decline despite the furlough scheme ending, uh, and it's expected to decline further in, in Q1 of 2021 to 3.8 percent and 2022 to 3.8%. Um, this, this labor market tightness is putting upward pressure on wages, which is then driving inflation. So inflation is set to peak at around 7.25%, although most estimates have been quite um quite conservative and it's possible that it might go further particularly with uh geopolitical tensions putting pressure on upper pressure on energy and gas prices uh the expectation when this was written which was uh, last week is that uh well most analyst est estimates in february were that inflation would fall back in may and june um that depends entirely on how transient some of these these pressures are so if energy prices continue to rise if um if supply chain constraints don't ease due to, to geopolitical tensions, 
then that horizon we pushed further but the expected rise is half due to energy prices and the rest falls on retail products and other services so looking to trading performance we've identified sort of four key themes that are likely to impact the retail sector uh, going forward and um, as graham mentioned you know we are at a sort of inflection point in that the government are loosening restrictions um, however, we believe that these are, are the sort of four key things to watch out for. So continuous disruption, as, as Graham mentioned, that is that seems to be here to stay. So businesses that are agile and able to adapt, shift supply chain production levels uh, and sort of meet consumers where they want to shop, whether that's online, in store or through intermediaries, uh, will really be, you know, the sort of the, the determinant of, um, of what success looks like going forward. There, are, there, remain, there remains a risk. Uh, going forward of new variants with, with future possibilities of lockdown, despite these measures being uh, being retracted by, by government currently. Um, however, on, the, on, a, on a positive note, you know, it seems that the Omicron variant is milder. Vaccination programs are, you know, uh, significantly reducing the pressure on hospitals. And it seems within the UK and Scotland, at least, that government mandates seem to target, uh, you know, working from home as a sort of lever they're willing to pull rather than, than going back to full lockdowns. But um, as with anything, it remains to be seen uh, should a new, more deadly variant emerge. Uh, as I mentioned, global supply chain issues remain and, and there are still issues, challenges with Brexit. So, you know, we, we have more restrictions coming in place or more border checks coming in place in, in June and July, uh, which could put increased friction and, and increase um, sort of pressures on, on supply chains. Uh, online is here to stay, no surprise for anyone, so I'll, I'll talk about footfall and online sales shortly, so I won't dwell too much on it now, but it does appear that despite stores reopening, online sales are, are considerably higher than they were pre-pandemic, and that's likely to remain uh, remain that way. Store footfall is also far lower, so it, how stores um, are used going forward will be a question I, I, I sort of tackle on a, on a future slide. Uh, and also transparency of sustainable actions, so we, we've, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Ernst & Young on uh, collaborating on their future consumer index and we've identified uh, through that work transparency uh, of, of, sort of business practices, ethical working practices and sustainable actions as a sort of key driver for consumer growth going forward. So, uh, you know, before we look at uh, we, we, we can look at two key drivers for, for consumer confidence. So before we retail, uh, review retail performance in the whole, uh, we, we've looked at consumer confidence. So we use the GFK um, consumer confidence index and total UK retail footfall. Um, they're both closely aligned. So you can see from this chart that confidence has been in decline since July of 2016. However, sort of accelerated with, with the, the hit of the pandemic and has tracked quite closely to aggregate UK total re, uh, footfall over the course of the pandemic. So we've seen a steady recovery. Um, we, you know, the start of the pandemic shown clearly, so it's been volatile through lockdowns and close to you know, nearly 100% decline in, in sort of peaks of, of the first lockdowns. Um, however, recovery began in April 21 when stores reopened uh, in the UK or in, in, in some parts of the UK, uh, but confidence impacted by fuel shortages uh, and the spectre of inflation came through sort of from September onwards, impacted confidence and footfall to a lesser degree. Uh, and Omicron obviously hit both of those measures in, in December. Uh, the sector's also been battling with supply chain disruption, as I mentioned. Uh, so lots of lots of headwinds going into um, going into 2022. However, you know, we should remember that consumer confidence is still uh, double what it was in uh, at this point in 2021. So some some green shoots there. So overall, the sector had a, a relatively buoyant year on, a, on an aggregate UK level, or at least it's had a buoyant second half. So since stores reopened, the whole sector has been in significant growth, peaking at around 12% growth over pre-pandemic in June, but still 7% um, higher in September. The sector is still nearly 5% above its 2019 levels in December, uh, which many wouldn't have predicted. Uh, going into the golden quarter. Strong food growth has been seen since the beginning of the pandemic with hospitality closed. Uh, you know, consumer share of wallet was, was highly limited and a lot of that spend was defer, uh, was moved into, into food and grocery spend. Um, but however, that's remained high despite hospitality uh, reopening. Non-food categories have been a driver for much of this year's growth. Christmas purchasing started far earlier than normal. So online searches for Christmas gifts started in earnest as far 
back as, as August. Um, and that was a sort of concerted effort between retailers, uh, the BRC to a certain extent, and, and government really to try and ease pressure on supply chains over, over that crucial, crucial quarter. Um, Non-food growth slowed as we got closer to Christmas, uh, partly in due to, we believe, the Omicron variant. Uh, Black Friday was very different this year. So instead of a, a Black Friday or even a Black Week, as we've seen in previous years, many brands uh, began marketing their Black Friday sales, uh, which were far steeper, this, uh, far shallower this year than, than normal, uh, as early as, as um, the beginning of November. So it was, it was more of a Black Month, less deep discounts. Um, so I suppose a positive thing for the retail sector um, in the sense that margins were, were higher than perhaps they have been in previous years. Um, despite the strong sales, you know, there, were, there was still a lot of disruption, a lot of channel shift happened. So a lot of spend was deferred, was moved online over December and November. And, um, you know, some, some of our members were reporting lead times for delivery to consumers as, as long as sort of nine to 10 days um, in, on orders being sort of uh, fulfilled in, in the first few weeks of December. So some, some challenges, although uh, nothing so acute that um, uh, as to cause some of the shortages that were being talked about earlier in 2021. So this chart shows uh, non-food online and in store. So the sort of all channel sales trend is in the red. Uh, the online penetration, which is the share of spend made online is in the light blue. You can see <clears throat> online sales growth in, in purple or light purple and, and store decline, uh, unfortunately, in the uh, in the blue or navy. So, uh, you know, you can, you can see through this chart, uh, pre-pandemic trend, Jan 19 to December 19, and then obviously the, the explosive growth of non-food uh, online spend from, from really from uh, April 2020 onwards. Looking to, to more recent times, so the back end of 2021, at the end of the chart, you can see that online sales have remained, for non-food at least, have remained you know, 20 to 30 percent higher than they were pre-pandemic. And although store sale decline has has shallowed dramatically compared to prior points of the pandemic, it still is you know five to ten percent lower, even in 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 November and December. Although it did nearly, uh, it did recover very briefly in June and and in September and October at the sort of height of of the recovery pre Omicron, uh, we also saw store sales nearly get back to. Um, to parity with, with pre-pandemic levels. So th this chart shows the, the, the category shift. So this is looking at December in specific in, in, in particular, but it's 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 fairly uh, the story hasn't changed much over the last few months. Um, so what we've what we've seen is that all categories have, have shifted significantly, although some less so than others. Um, a few categories of notes are are clothing, so the largest of the non-food categories. Uh, this has seen has been a huge driver of 2021 sector growth, and uh, shift to online has grown by nearly 11 percentage points, uh, which is which is huge considering that stores were open for most of this period. Uh, footwear, which was resilient earlier in the pandemic, has seen a shift from more casual, trainer-led growth to more formal occasion shoes as people return to offices and go to more formal events again. Um, however, you know growth has hard has been harder to deliver in recent months. Um, despite you know, a, a significant shift to, to online. Uh, we've seen ease of delivery, you know, known sizing has really differentiated some, some companies from the other. So although these sectors have been positive overall, uh, the sort of the, the, the growth rates within that, those categories have been quite, quite mixed. Um, furniture sales have been not incredibly healthy. So furniture has seen some of the worst of, of the inflationary pressures we've seen uh, over the over recent times. So the, the price of getting a container from China to the UK, uh, you know, in China being where most of this furniture is, is, is built and assembled uh, is, is, is tenfold on what it was pre-pandemic. And that's filtered through uh, quite strongly into furniture prices. Despite that, furniture sales in January were, were I believe, 40% up from where they were uh, pre-pandemic. So still incredibly strong growth, growth there. Grocery, which which has hovered at near seven percent share of spend made online for the course or most of the five years pre pandemic, rose to uh, twelve percent uh, in in December and it has been around twelve to fourteen percent in most of the month leading up to the end of twenty twenty one. We've also seen new concepts open in that space, so we've seen dark supermarkets spring up across the continent, but also quite a lot in urban centres in the UK, the likes of Gorillas, uh, Wheezy, 
uh, get here lots of very funny sounding names but very interesting business models um and and those don't seem to be going anywhere supermarkets have been partnering with last mile delivery firms like uber eats deliveroo to um try and also capture some of that market which has been driven predominantly by people working from home um jewelry did very well in route to christmas perhaps unsurprisingly but there's been a huge um but also seen a huge shift to online uh compared to most categories so looking looking at sort of trading figures um you know it was quite a healthy healthy end to the year and then a sort of healthy peak period for quite a few retailers uh this is all on a on a uh, uh these were retail sales announcements made on, on a sort of pre-pandemic basis so we saw uh, a lot of companies uh particularly those with sort of better developed online propositions like the very group ASOS uh, and even the mamas and papas do particularly well. So quite a strong, a strong uh, rise, particularly in, in fashion uh, in the last months of 2021 compared to pre-pandemic. And the grocers, of course, have done particularly well as well with little sort of beating everyone out in terms of total growth. But uh, versus pre-pandemic, you know, the discounters have had a particularly good a good run in 2021 uh, and the rest of the supermarkets have also seen healthy single digit digit growth uh, so strong demand in 2021 has mitigated many of the challenges the sector has faced but however this demand now that restrictions have been eased and people's share of wallet is now open to all the options it was open to pre-pandemic um, these challenges are going to be a lot more evident in 2022 so um, you know operation challenge operational challenges will will still be in um, will continue to be intense uh, the, the sector has weathered them fairly well so um, you know protected by this unprecedented demand and therefore an ability to spend more to to meet those challenges um but ha but things could have been a lot better without that that sort of tightness in in supply chains uh as, as spend shifts back to you know bars beaches restaurants um you know we, we we do expect some very difficult comparable periods so some challenges for many retailers as they try and compare to what was an exceptional period of demand um and you know, we think that um, consumer behaviors, which I'll come on to now, have fundamentally changed. So uh, we've seen the way that people shop uh, change completely. And and the retailers who've been able to meet those those changing expectations have uh, have definitely succeeded in what is a quite a difficult, uh, a difficult market. So uh, the, our, our future consumer index is, is a partnership we have with Ernst & Young. They track um, uh, a, a quite a substantial sample in 27 countries and we work with them on their their uk uk outputs sort of blending the brc and src view into into their their uh sort of consumer views and essentially what we've what we've done with them is um is build out a number of segments so the segments that we see as as from the research as as sort of the the, the core ones during the pandemic and post pandemic so this slide shows the, the May wave of the survey compared to the October wave. So uh, as I was saying to Graham before the call, things move so quickly. Um, this was taken just, just before Omicron hit and sort of almost just before uh, inflation was making it into, into sort of many media outlets headlines. So um, the core change we saw in October and part of this could have been due to, to COP26 obviously, which happened at the same time, was a strong shift in, in how important uh sustainability ethical consumption became as a segment for many consumers so growth of 18 percent uh of, of respondents in may to 26 percent of respondents in in october of 2021 uh, affordability so in uncertain times uh you know value is is the core consideration for many many shoppers and that's definitely what we saw throughout most of the pandemic it was still important in in october and indeed we expected to have surpassed planet first coming into 2020 two and certainly in the next wave however uh it was it was really quite quite staggering to see quite how strongly a lot of people felt um about making more ethical decisions in their in their shopping uh shopping patterns so so a lot of these echo what we've what we've already discussed so the shift to online we've, we've already talked about price and purpose so you know the right price at the right time but also the sort of brand mission behind a retailer and transparency and how they how they operate and why their products are, are sort of more ethical. Uh, home centricity, so with people working now, particularly in, in sort of white collar jobs, 
uh, operating in a hybrid way, despite restrictions being lifted. We expect home centricity to be a, a core theme, ongoing theme, um, as people sort of build their home, increased home time into their behaviors, whether that's uh, exercising more at home, you know, cooking more at home, spending more time with family, or indeed having delivery sent to home rather than going out to, to stores on the days that they're working. Uh, and sustainability, so, you know, that means that that word means uh, a whole number of, of different things to different people, whether it's carbon reduction, what, you know, waste and water reduction, uh, ethical work, you know, supply, ethical supply chain management and workforce management. Um, all those things are, are becoming increasingly important to, to UK consumers. Um, so from, from the research we, we, we've seen, and this is echoed in our, in our, in our footfall data that people are visiting stores less frequency, so frequently. So on an aggregate level in the UK, uh, people are, our footfall is down 40% for shopping centers versus pre-pandemic, about 20% pre-pandemic for, um, for uh, uh, high streets and uh, near, we're nearing pre-pandemic levels for, uh, for retail parks. So what we have seen is although people are visiting stores less frequently, looking at data from our, our footfall partner, ShopperTrack, who have the best sample nationally of, of, of shopping locations, and they also uh, integrate into stores to measure conversion and average transaction value and all those interesting metrics, they've seen that average transaction values for those visiting stores has actually increased substantially, which is why our, our sales data wasn't showing as substantial a, de a decline as, as the footfall decline that we're seeing. So people are much more purposeful in their shopping visits. Um, they've usually researched online, they know exactly what they want, being able to see stock in store before they visit and having that certainty has been identified as a, as a, as a key driver for visit visitation. Um, and we, a lot more people, 37% have said they will shop online for products that they would previously have gone to stores for. So people switching a lot of their, their, their missions to, to online, uh, online specialists than they had previously. Um, however, online experience, although a lot was forgiven during the pandemic due to all the supply chain challenges mentioned and, uh, you know, goodwill from retail, from consumers for all of the sort of things that retail did for them over the course of the pandemic. Um, many are now saying that, you know, Availability of delivery is 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 core, and getting items you know, within the time frame they've asked for is is a significant driver for them choosing what a retailer or not. Um, and also lack of stock, so uh, SKUs re running out of stock or SKU reduction was cited as a significant uh, challenge for retailers um, for for sort of consumer shopping online. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly touch on this uh, because as I'm aware of time, but um, you know, one, one element of, of the online uh, policy landscape at the moment has been uh, stronger customer authentication. So um, it was this was a provision of, of the government's payment services directive or PSD2, uh, and it was designed to increase the security of payments. Um, it was originally this was going to happen in September of 2019. However, as the deadline approached, it was clear that um, that many industries, including retail, were not prepared. BRC were, were quite, and the SRC were instrumental in, in working with the FCA to push this deadline back to September of last year. Uh, and a managed rollout has been agreed between the industry and the FCA to facilitate the best outcomes for the sector and its customers. Um, the main focus of the rollout was, was 3D Secure and its successor, 3D Secure 2, which was a much more user-friendly version of the technology, uh, which integrated natively with apps through uh, what's called an SDK. Um, however, a lot, lots of other options sprung up and the market's a lot more competitive than just the sort of government um, sort of uh, designed solutions. And it seems uh, that this hasn't had the sort of negative effects that we we've, we've, were potentially expecting uh, ahead of the first rollout. So online sales haven't slowed uh, significantly despite this, this rollout going, going uh, ahead. I guess the key, 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 key question for retailers is, um, you know, have you got the right partners in place? Have you, you know, reevaluated your, your payment providers and systems to ensure the lowest cost of friction? Um, and you know, tied to our, our, our research, this that reducing friction is one of the key differentiators that will ensure success or failure going forward, um, given the online uh, prevalent the prevalence of online shopping. Buy now, pay later has also been quite a, a hot topic of conversation, um, and you know, it, it, it's. It seems that it's a case of you know when not if these these credit providers will be 
we regulated uh, consumer groups are putting significant pressure on government to avoid uh, an Australian style model of self regulation in the UK. Uh, and despite government findings so far showing that what they deemed as relatively little consumer harm, uh, a joint submission by the FCA and the Australian Consumer Action Law Centre point to research suggesting that 21% of buy now pay later users in Australia had missed a payment in the last 12 months and 20 had to cut back on or go without essentials such as food to make repayments on time, which are obviously not, not outcomes that we would like uh, in the UK. So um, uh, one of the heads of the FCA said, that said no in certain terms, there's a clear link between, you know, buy now pay later financial hardship uh, and, you know, the fact that there's not been any harm seen in the UK yet is not is not because there isn't harm being done, but potentially due to lack of evidence. So, so there's some strong messages coming out of, of government and then sort of um, non-governmental bodies. Um, what shape the regulation takes remains to be seen, but um, it's very likely that we, that these sort of forms of credit, which were a large driver for growth, and now most retailers will have them even on small basket sizes. Um, but it's, it's quite likely they'll be classified as a traditional form of credit, which could put pressure. Or, or slow some of the growth we saw uh, in, in online. <clears throat> um, touching on value for money, again, I won't, I won't dwell too much, but um, we, we've seen that consumers, when, when you know, inflation rises, when uncertainty is higher, people switch from, from discretionary spending to, to essentials. So 41% of those surveyed in, in October, we expect this to be higher now, are spending less on non-essentials. Uh, 50 C price is important and loyalty is at an all time low in terms of consumers switching between different different providers. 56% uh, of consumers will, will focus more on value for money in the future and have said they would actually split their baskets over multiple retailers to ensure that. Uh, and many are, are, are concerned about COVID-19 and sort of other uh, economic pressures on their on their finances. So, so some real challenges uh, there going forward. Uh, we expect this to drive better consumption though so um, rather than buying more so volumes increasing we expect people to values to increase so people will buy potentially um, items that are more expensive but have a longer uh, usage life that they have to replace less frequently they're more likely to repair things than replace them and we're seeing lots of retailers uh, investing in sort of circular economy style services within their businesses to help um, service some of that demand uh, after the success over the, the pandemic of, of services like Depop, Vestiaire Collective, uh, Spock and, and others. Um, many are, are sort of becoming less material and saying they need to buy fewer physical items because they simply don't need them as much. Uh, and many are, are switching sort of conversely to some of the things we've, we, we've said already about people buying online. Um, they, they will take a local option if that's available. However, what local means now has changed fundamentally with far fewer people going into city and town centres to um, to uh, work and, and therefore spend. And that's it, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a bit of a whistle stop tour. Hopefully I didn't remember about too much, but um, yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. That, that uh, lot of fascinating stuff in there, a lot of it's new or emerging uh, thinking in terms of how the whole retail world now looks uh, as we come out of the pandemic. Um, I've got, I've got a few questions here. Don't don't want to um, sort of put you too much um, out of your comfort zone here in terms of throwing stuff at you, but I'll, I'll throw a few things at you and, and, and maybe develop some of the, the themes from the presentation there. But in terms of, well, I, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a real estate lawyer, so I, I'm always thinking about bricks and mortar. And, and in the context of retail, that starts with stores, so obviously there's been a good bit of discussion there about online versus uh, at stores, but you know, from what you're seeing, what is the future for stores as we move through 2022 and beyond? It's a very good question. And it's one that lots of people are, are definitely asking. I think um, it, it depends really. I, I think there's, there will always be a place for stores. And I think, you know, we can be reassured that, um, you know, some we're seeing an increase in online pure play retailers uh, you're moving into physical space and we're seeing some quite exciting things happening in that space so I went into my first Amazon Fresh store uh, this week and you know I've, I've seen WH Smith now are actually replicating that model using the exact same technology uh, and they've done so in the US for the first time so we're seeing sort of 
new use cases in terms of automation and lowering costs from 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 staffing i think the uk had a bit of an, an oversupply in, in retail stock coming into the pandemic and we, we saw that vacancy rates were rising gently before the pandemic started um, what we've seen is a sharp increase in in vacancies amongst shopping centers so in the data that we track with the local data company shopping centers are near 20 percent vacancy rate uh, and they've got the longest sort of long and short-term vacancies retail parks perform quite well and you know we've seen some innovative usage of the larger format stores within retail parks so lots of sort of radical partnerships so companies bring in complementary brands services um to, to really round off and, and give people more of a reason to visit those locations you're seeing high street stores uh well all stores being used for for as, as part of the online journey so we've worked with fashion retailers who've built kiosks into their stores and now if a customer it was a fashion brand we were working with uh, if a customer goes online within the radius of that store or the catchment area of that store uh, they can speak to a colleague live uh, at the kiosk within that store and they can advise them on what they would want and sort of coax them to come in and have a have a fitting so um i think the way the stores are used some some companies have, have seen huge success by sort of innovating more quickly and sort of bringing the online journey into the physical space i think we've also got to remember that you know, pre-pandemic, 80% of all spend was made in stores. And as a nation, we, we like going to the high street and we like trying things on. And I think what we'll be telling now is, although footfalls a lot has been a lot lower, now that the government has sort of said, well, uh, well both Scottish and English, the pandemic's over, in effect, what, what, what effect will that signal have on stores? And will we see people uh, going out in greater numbers? Uh, I think quite possibly. The only other risk on the other side is is hybrid working and what that means for for town centres. You know, the BRC and SRC are sort of remote first at the moment. So you know, I'm going into the office a lot less than I was previously. You know, the Googles and Facebooks of the world are only mandating a three week in the office, three day a week in the office. So you know, if you suddenly lose two fifths of your of your of your people coming to town on, on a weekly basis, what does that mean for some of those prime A prime A properties? Um, and also tourism as well for for large centres like Edinburgh. Uh, London, you know, how will that affect um, sort of the mix within those within those centres, um, and how do those centres attract more 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 UK consumers? It's uh, yeah, difficult question. <laughs> yeah, so I suppose we'll only now start to see how much footfall will uh, change as compared to pre-pandemic times, as as the world is now properly getting back to normal. Again, yeah. one, one of the trends on back what you were saying there is although we're working more from home uh that's maybe made a shift from spend in city centers to spend more locally and has there been a positive outcome there yes yeah, so we, we've seen so again i was speaking to a retailer who was saying that they um you know of all their of all their store portfolio the ones that were sort of closer to residential centers um you know for most of the pandemic were performing significantly better than their what were what were previously their best performing locations um so there's, there's there's a bit of a rebalancing taking place and you're seeing some landlords you know affecting turnover based rents to attract people into stores you know we've, we've been quite unique as a as a country and that we've been in a in a system of upwards only rent reviews for more or less as long as i can remember um and you know many high streets priced out a lot of companies that simply couldn't afford to to open a, a pitch there so um, I think it's you know there's been a cost reduction there. Um, obviously, business rates are taking a bit bit more time. The government don't seem to want to um, to do much in that space, uh, and any sort of rebalancing due to property prices changing will will take time to filter through. Um, but um, I think you know local governments are doing some interesting things to try and coax businesses to to, to start trading again. So I, I've got um, you know I've got faith that actually this could be a could have been a, a positive thing for 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 um, Scottish and and um, and UK high streets. Yeah, I, I just I heard you mention the word rates there. I was expecting your colleague David Lonsdale to immediately jump in and uh, give us some soapbox. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's been banging, banging that drum, or well, we all have for a very very long time. But um, yes, we were we were hoping for something in the previous budget, uh, but uh, unfortunately, did not did not come to be. Yeah, not not, not holding breath on, on that. Yeah. Okay, I'm just aware of time, so I'm going to ask two very quick things. One coming out of all of all of that, as I say, there's so much information 
there and, and so many trends to try and identify. But going forward, what are your top predictions in 2022? Um, what, what are we going to see that's really going to come to pass and be of significance? That's a good question. So I think um, uh, on the sort of there, there are positives and negatives. I think I think the continuous disruption piece is one is one that that sort of I think retailers and businesses have to be prepared for. Um, I think we're going to see a sort of a, a, a tightening of, of consumer spend in in the immediate term, sort of in the lead up to April, um, and depending on what happens, potentially ge geopolitically. Um, I probably would have given you a different answer actually, uh, sort of a week ago to what I would say today, but. Um, I think there'll, yeah, there'll be pressure on discretionary spend. I think there'll be there'll be increased pressure tied to that on 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 um, sustainable practices. Something I didn't I didn't actually get um, didn't talk about was how um, on the sustainable side. Although I think eighty percent of the consumers we surveyed said you know they would they want to buy more ethically going forward. Um, almost the same number said they wouldn't pay more for it. So there's a sort of intention action gap there. Um, that although it's it's of increasing importance, um, how companies build that extra cost, if there is extra cost, into their into their um, into their sort of product lines is um, is going to be a, a real interesting challenge. Uh, so that that's definitely something that's that's on our radar. I think digital is here to stay. I think I don't really like the term omni-channel. I think we're, we live in a in a bit of a post-channel world. Consumers will buy where they want to buy. There are a lot more. Um, able to able and willing to purchase online as they've learned those behaviors over the pandemic, particularly in older demographics who, who uh, based on Google research, not my, not my own words, uh, were, were less frequent users of, of online channels. Um, so I think you have to have a, an online digital strategy and you have to be able to move quickly and think like a, like a, like a tech company in, in those sort of innovation cycles. So I guess those two things are a focus on, you know, sustainable credentials, how they how you communicate those to, to consumers who are very um, increasingly demanding on that front and how you in, integrate digital um, into your into, into your operations. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, retailers have to be uh, alert to all of the new trends, be able flexible enough to capture them and then drop them as soon as the next new trend comes along, which will, will, will be the thing they need to pursue. Um, what, one last thought then, I mean, we've, we've talked about some of the, the challenges and there, there are plenty and, and, and you, know, you talked about headwinds. Um, just zeroing in on something positive as we sort of move to a close, the, the big opportunities for retail going forward, what, what are the things that um, you know, the, the sector can grasp and, and really seek to profit from going forward? I think, um, so an example I give is um, innovation is being rewarded quite heavily at the moment. So uh, by that, I mean, uh, there's a children's wear company that, that we work with. Um, and essentially their previous model was they would have consumers come into stores uh, you know, expected parents, they would they would guide them around those stores and uh, sort of show them all the things they need to buy over the course of you know, them having their baby and into the years ahead. Uh, and then you know, hopefully sell them those items at the end. Um, during the pandemic, they very quickly spun up without any real thought, really, uh, a, a, Zoom, uh, a Zoom platform. So they had one colleague going into store and essentially demoing what they would demo one-on-one -on -one with expected parents to now audiences of several hundred. Um, and that, that one innovation generated, you know, basically meant the difference between them having a good and a bad pandemic. They were one of the sort of victors, if, if you can call it that, um, in, in, the, in the fashion space um, and the children's wear space. So I think taking risks, shortening innovation, cycles and ensuring you've got the right people to, to do that are all sort of incredibly uh, incredibly important but uh, i suppose it just goes to show that even if you know even at uh, even if fashion on aggregate was down 20 or 30 percent for most of the sort of first lockdown and part of the second there were still companies within those categories doing incredibly well because they were trying new things and, and being uh being bold with those with those assumptions so take 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 a bit more a bit more risk uh, is what i would, what I would say <laughs> Quite, quite interesting mixing retail with zoom with formats that we're very familiar with zoom personal shopping and, and, yeah. and um 
all sort of new combinations I'm sure are going to be coming forward, uh, new ideas. Um, I, I guess and, and unless there's, there's any other questions out there, um, Kyle, I would I'd suggest we'll move to a close. Um, any final thoughts from yourself there as, as we, we move off? For myself, um, just, just to say uh, thank you very much for having me. This is my, I think, my third and my, my last one of these as I'll be, uh, as I'll be leaving the SRC. But, um, but no, I think, I think we're entering sort of, we, we've been in uncertain times for quite, for quite a while. Um, I think there is, there is re some reason for optimism despite, uh, you know, glo global challenges. Um, and yeah, I expect the retail sector to do what it does best and uh, meet those challenges head on as we as we as we go on. So if anyone wants to know more, do please get in touch uh, with either myself or David uh, Lonsdale. Uh, we have a, an insight suite of products uh, for both retail yeah. and, and elsewhere. So um, yeah, please do reach out if you want to know more. That's great, um, and thanks for that. Um, I guess from my perspective, um, it's been great to host you and um, we're delighted to have shared these insights with everyone here today. Um, I think there's um, a lot of interesting uh, outcomes there, a lot of interesting themes and uh, coming through. I, some of the things I sort of saw were just about the, the sort of growth of online is obviously continuing, trying to maintain margins uh, and, you know, the kind of thought that people are so used to shopping online that they become appalled if they can't get their hands on something within two minutes. Um, uh, and so the consumer expectations are growing ever higher, whether it's online or, or in store, but um, plenty for the, the, the sector to be combating there. And uh, much, to, much work still to be done in 2022 um, going forward. But uh, again, Kyle, thank you very much for your, your time today. Uh, and uh, very pleased to have hosted today together with the Scottish Retail Consortium and thanks to them for helping set this up. Hopefully it's been a useful session for everyone who's tuned in and again thank you very much for your time.